Okay, we seem to be live. So hello everyone and welcome to the changing role of Godzilla. So we're going to talk actually fairly seriously about everyone's favorite Kaiju and the different ways, ways he's been portrayed over the years. So I will start by having my wonderful panelists, my wonderful Godzilla experts introduce themselves. Let's start with Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Bosarch. I'm a librarian here in Baltimore City. Um, and um, you appear to have lost Liz. Charlie, why don't you do your introduction while she sees if she can get back on? Okay, my name is uh, Charlie Brown. I do, I write under the name C.D. Brown. I'm a novelist and filmmaker. Uh, from New Orleans, and uh, along with uh, two books, Fate Stiletto and Vamp City from Griffinwood Press. Uh, I also currently direct the live streaming uh, music show, Escape from the Secret Lab, where an evil scientist is trying to do evil experiments on New Orleans bands that, that, uh, that rolls every Sunday night at uh, 8 p.m. Central, in fact, tonight. So if you like surf music, come, uh, come by the Secret Lab tonight. Okay, Liz, let's try you again. I'm so sorry, my internet just like cut out. <laughs> it, ha it happens. Oh goodness. Um, hi, I'm Liz Bosarge. I'm a librarian here in Baltimore City at the Pratt. And um, my specialization would be Kaiju comics. And my favorite, uh, my favorite Kaiju is Mothra. So she's like Godzilla's little sidekick. Awesome, John. Hi, I'm John Wiswell. I'm a disabled writer who lives where New York keeps all its trees. And I've been coming to Baltimore ever since I was literally one year old. It's my, it's my second home. It's where my grandmother lived until she was 101. And I'm so glad to be able to participate in Balticon. Uh, I also grew up on Kaiju. Uh, I grew up on $1 rentals of Godzilla movies, uh, and they had a wonderfully disastrous effect on me. Uh, I have uh, grown up to be mostly a short story writer and have written all sorts of kaiju stories. I wrote a hard science fiction kaiju story for Nature Magazine, a kaiju horror story for Pseudopod, and it just goes on. Uh, I talk about Godzilla so much that random friends have just knitted me Godzilla plushies, and whenever they find Godzilla artwork, they just send it to me at this point, which suggests that I have some kind of a problem that hopefully will work out over the hour. And Daniel? Hello, I'm Dan Kimmel. I'm a, a Boston area based film critic. And so I'm, I, I, I'm not coming here as the Godzilla authority, but have seen many, many, many Godzilla films and have reviewed some of them. Uh, the person I wish was here who is, who I defer to as the Godzilla authority is Bob Eggleton, the Hugo award winning artist who knows Godzilla inside out, literally. I was on a panel with him once where he dropped some Japanese name of, so I was talking to so-and-so. I said, excuse me, I don't know that name. Who is it? He goes, he was the man inside the Godzilla suit. So I don't profess that level of expertise, but I will be here as a the professional critic. Okay. Um, Jennifer Povey, I am a writer of science fiction and fantasy, and I do have solid expertise in B-movies in general, but I am here to moderate because I am not the big Godzilla expert on the panel. So I know just enough to get into trouble or to get potentially stomped on. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a question that is easy, really easy and really difficult at the same time. Favorite Godzilla movie? Liz, you're allowed to do a comic. I will be, I will be nice. Who wants to go first? Probably, uh, oh, go, go ahead, Daniel, go ahead, Daniel. Because I'm, I'm gonna pick a weird one. It's not, it's not considered one of the best ones, but it's a personal favorite because it's, it's Godzilla's Revenge. And the <laughs> reason, the reason I like it is because when I, I, my daughter, who's now in her mid twenties, when she was a little kid, went through the phase a lot of little kids go through of into monsters. Bob Eggleton had found out about this he had illustrated some Godzilla, well, all of the Godzilla tie-ins for that awful uh, 90s American one, including children's books. 
You know, like all the monsters on Monster <laughs> Island are playing, but nobody wants to play with Godzilla. He, didn't <laughs> play, he, he just did the illustration. So he gave me a serious Godzilla book that he had done some essays for. And it said, if you're introducing a child to Godzilla, the movie to show is Godzilla's Revenge, which for those of you who haven't seen it, it's this little boy is being picked on and he dreams he goes to Monster Island and Godzilla's son who's being picked on by the other monsters learns to stand up for himself and the little boy learns to stand up for himself. So it was a bonding thing with my, my daughter and myself watching this, which very much a lesser Godzilla film. I do oh. love Baby Godzilla though. You gotta love Baby Godzilla. <laughs> I, I remember the old cartoon that had Godzuki oh, yes. on the ship. Yes. I love that when I was a kid. Okay, John. Me? All right. So I have I have difficulty. It's it's like picking between my children. I know. But that's the, why it's a hard question. So I'm going to give you two. I'm going to cheat just by a factor of two. Uh, first, the 2016 film Shin Godzilla is probably the technically best made. Uh, and it digs so deeply into uh, Japanese dissatisfaction with government and desire to reform it and that Godzilla is a crucible by which we look at how social safety nets and disaster relief ought to work and how people ought to care um, and I, I think it's utterly brilliant um, and it manages to make the umpteenth Godzilla destroys a city scene perhaps the most literally awesome and chilling and yet I, I equally love Godzilla versus King Ghidorah from the Heisei era in the 90s, which is one of the cheesy, one mm. of the cheesier ones. It's I think it might be the first Godzilla movie to just straight up have time travel in it, um, where we like we go back in time to make Godzilla not exist, but aliens go back in time with us and make Ghidorah exist, exist instead. And then we need to go back in time again, hoping to get Godzilla back. And in the wonderful words of the angry video game nerd, the good news is Godzilla's back. The bad news is Godzilla's back. Uh, it is just a, a, a tessellating series of failures uh, as kaiju just get worse and worse and worse. And it's so funny and so cheesy. Um, and I love, like, I actually love the brilliant heaviness of some Godzilla films and the brilliant cheesiness of some, the unabashed cheesiness of some Godzilla films. Roughly equally. They're just edifying on different levels. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, you just want to trash Tokyo. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But, but in the words of the Hulk, but giant monster. Right, right, right. Charlie? Uh, I'm going to go with one, though. Uh, here in New Orleans, they, they used to show a Godzilla film a week on, I think it was Sunday morning. They, like, they would run through all the Godzilla movies, and then they would run through all the Abbott and Costello <laughs> movies. And if you know me, you now understand me better. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm going to go with one of those uh, old, old 60s, 70s ones that really stuck with me, that really kind of frightened me. And that was Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. <laughs> and, and that's one where this, the, the, the monster is this ecological horror that evolves over the course of the, of the movie. It becomes, I think, three or four different forms. And each time Godzilla has to stop it uh, until finally uh, he destroys it. But uh, yeah, that one's that one scared the crap out of me as a kid because you know this it was this I, this was the seventies when I was watching it and you know uh, I lived in I lived in Los Angeles in the eighties uh, when when we still had things like leaded gas and and no catalytic converters and you know and and so smog was a very big part of my childhood so uh, so seeing that uh, just yeah that one was that one still haunts me to this day actually so that's why i'll, I'll go with that one okay liz it, it my favorite is a comic but i do have a favorite movie too <laughs> yeah favorite, i just figured i'd let the comic expert it's cataclysm i think it's one of the newer comics but it's it's really good the quality is good the story is really good it gets into like the telepath uh telepathy stuff with like King Ghidorah's heads, and also it's it's got Mothra in a really interesting relationship with Beatine, uh, and Godzilla doesn't trash anything because everything's already trash. He just like he's just mad at people, like he's reached his peak. He's like, I can't deal with you anymore. You're the worst. 
I'm going to say mine has to be that old cartoon because I was the right age when I watched it and Godzuki was so cute and so annoying at the same time. That sort of delightful combination. So many pop punk bands do Go Go Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I was going to do a Godzilla cartoon, pick one. It would be Bam Bambi meets Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Thirty I seconds of, have... of pure hilarity. <laughs> I see we have Godzilla meets Bambi in the chat. Yeah. I yeah that. That okay. So I think as we've already mentioned two of these, before I get into the really meaty question, what is it with Godzilla fighting another monster? Because I would say even possibly the majority of Godzilla movies, Godzilla is fighting somebody. Whether it's King Kong, the smog monster, a mechanical version of himself, twice. <laughs> what do you think is the phenomenon that causes these, this obsession with having Godzilla fight another monster? Mm. And yeah, destroy all monsters. Somebody mentioned destroy all destroy monsters, monsters, which yeah. is kind of the peak of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll, let me go first on this one because I have a very specific answer for this, um, if you don't mind. No. Uh, I think I, I go again. I, I my era is the rubber suit era. I although I have appreciated many many eras of that. And one of the things that digital Godzilla does not have that rubber suit Godzilla has is an expressive face. Computer technology, as you know, as a filmmaker, I look at it and say, you know, computer technology just hasn't quite gotten there yet, so that you get as you know the, the later these later these last couple of ones is better. But you saw in Godzilla specifically this kind of like I want to say he's kind of like Popeye. He's kind of this. A water creature who's not who's vaguely dissatisfied with being on the land. He's always got those those got those heavy eyebrows, and he's, that 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 look of a brawler to him. And uh, and then you know his his uh, his antagonists have the same thing. Rodan's got that bird look, that kind of condorish look that is very aggressive. King Ghidorah is a three headed dragon, uh, although you know. Ghidorah is the jankiest of the puppetry. <laughs> he's still kind of, uh, he's still got, he, you know, he has those three, those three heads are really well crafted, you know. And so, and so I feel like there, you know, there is a, a uh, personification happening with the rubber suits that you don't get with the computers. And that, yeah, that there's, it's almost like, it's almost like pro wrestling, which is as popular in Japan as it is in America and worldwide, where ja the Japanese have their own wrestling culture. So I kind of, you know, with sumo and also, also obviously. And so I think that's just, you know, a, from a cultural standpoint, it does kind of say, okay, it's these, it's these icons of certain animalia and they're just going to fight each other. Uh, but there is also this kind of level of, of, you know, there is the cooperation angle, but there's, it's also it's like, oh, we're throwing them in the ring and here we go. And that's kind of that's kind of how I see it. It's just like they're movies that are movies as professional wrestling. Okay, that's a good answer. That's really good. Like I don't know if you're if you follow like the Andre the Giant story, particularly in Japan, but like Andre always has to win, like wherever he goes. And I kind of equate the two of them because Godzilla, he doesn't always have to win, but like people want to see their guy win. And Godzilla is like their guy. It's the worst I thing Vince McMahon ever did was he made Andre the Giant made a bad him guy. the heel. It was so terrible. It was the worst thing he ever did. That's the, he's 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 gonna he's gonna pay for that later. On. Yeah, later. that is. And I feel like, and you're right. Like the Japanese wrestling culture, which I had not deeply considered, but that's 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 it. They like to see like that's like their guy. That's like their their person. And I think later ones, they're like, oh, they're from different areas, so maybe. I'm not about that, but I, I think that that's an interesting perspective when you think about like the the culture around like warriors and fighting and like a type of like jousting, but the Japanese equivalent, like you want to see your guy win. Um, I view it slightly differently. I think about like the different monsters as different personifications of things. So that is from the bias of Mothra being my favorite monster, but you see them having different interactions with people and with each other. Um, 
and I, especially like Mothra and like Batra and stuff, they have like their own connections to like how they feel about the earth and how they want to kill people or not kill people. And then their interactions with Godzilla are sort of reflected in that. Although I think in some of the earlier movies, it really is just like two rubber suits slapping at each other a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think the Ghidorah movie where like, he's like slapping at Rodan and he's like, I don't want to fight him. That's possibly like peak silly right there. And Mothra's like, yo, get, get two. What are we doing? Yeah. Uh- <laughs> Uh, the history of the Showa era kind of illuminates a lot of the original appeal of of Godzilla fighting another giant monster. Because at first, he's a villain who needs to be stopped. Like Mothra comes in and Kong comes in because Godzilla is rampaging too much. But what Toho didn't originally expect is that people would grow to really like the bad guy. Uh, and so gradually he has a redemption arc where he softened more and more. Eventually he gets a kid uh which you know always is supposed to calm down a bad dude uh but but further um he winds up representing japanese pain on a world stage the japanese don't want to see an outsider destroy their pain uh and that that was a pushback that a lot of japanese critics had to to kong versus god the original kong versus godzilla where an american monster beat ours like really that's what you want to do right now um and so you see uh, Godzilla refused to soften all the way, though. I agree with uh, with Liz. Peak cheesiness is a wonderful uh, in in, Go- in Gitter the Three Headed Monster when Rodan, Mothra, and Godzilla have to have a meeting about what they're going to do about Gitter, which on its face is wonderfully hilarious. And the two twin Mothra's twins are translating for everyone except for Godzilla because he's using bad language <laughs> and he's swearing in roar speak. Uh, and this is this is the like. He's the Stone Cold Steve Austin of dinosaurs, which is like a wonderful role that he he continues to to per, to perpetuate. And the reason that he endures more than other than other giant monsters in the genre is that it's not the pure one that's going to come defend us. It's the avatar of our pain mm-hmm. that's going to come fight other threats. And and there is something to be said about xenophobia. Uh, that especially as the series goes on, they're just like aliens. It's just someone from somewhere else, or it's they're from the stars. It's fine. We well, we made a move. Look, we just signed a deal, a five picture deal with Hollywood. So now they're definitely not from America anymore. They're from space because we're all afraid that anybody who shows up from space might be an evil cockroach. Uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, Daniel, Dan, Sally. Yeah. Well, you go. Um, I go all the way back to the original Gohira. The, you know, no, no Raymond Burr, the original uh, film. That was a serious film. And Godzilla was, you know, a, a metaphor for basically, you know, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But what happened was over time is Godzilla became sort of like a, a mascot or an icon for Japanese pride. And so as I saw in the comments, somebody said he became, you know, uh, an alpha predator, you know, defending his territory. Yeah, Godzilla in Japan became on the same side. And so he's defending it against all these, these other monsters to the point that was one of the second or third cycle of films. I, I don't remember all the titles, but I remember seeing a Japanese Godzilla film, oh, in the, in the aughts. In which at the end, after Godzilla has saved the day and now goes back into the ocean or something, this little girl goes, there's a little bit of Godzilla in all of us. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, and really, and, you know, it's like, you know, it, it became an identi- identifying thing. You know, God, God, okay. we are Godzilla. So I would like to move on to the next question because I know that Charlie has to leave early. Yeah. And I'd like to give him a chance to go first and answer this one. And the question is, we know, that, we know that Godzilla started out as a personification of the bomb. We know this, it's, it's explicit, it's been stated. Later, Godzilla becomes the protector, almost in some cases the hero, but it's still very dangerous. Mm. How much do you feel that reflects Japan as a small island somewhat limited in natural resources, they've become very dependent on atomic power. How much do you feel that the transformation of Godzilla from rampaging to, maybe he'll rampage a little bit, we can't let him rampage too much, to almost being tamed, being powered and tamed, reflects that shift in 
from atomic energy as thing that destroys cities to atomic energy as thing which powers cities. Charles? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and we were, you know, I think I think you have that I think you have that kind of interesting bookend happening as we talked about John uh, talked about Shin Godzilla and the original Gojira. Uh, you have that kind of book ending where you see you see Japan uh, psychoanalyzing itself. And we remember that atomic energy is a savior for them, but also they had that huge tsunami yeah. that that went through the nuclear power plant and almost destroyed the island. I mean, it was it was really, really bad. I can't remember if that happened before or after Shin Godzilla. I, I, I don't know the time. Uh, but anyway, but you, so you see, you see at first, you know, on one hand, yes, this is a, this is a country that the only place where the, where a nuclear bomb has been dropped offensively. I mean, we've, we've tested them, but this is where the offensive in the war bomb happened. And so Godzilla comes out of that. And so they have to deal with, you know, they have to deal with this monster, this creation, and that, that, that is a destructive force. By the time we get to Shin Godzilla, Godzilla is again the destructive force. And this time it's Japan uh, can't defend itself. And that is a, that is a giant worry um, for them because they do, not have, they do not have a standing army. They have a civil defense force, which is highly technological, but very, very small. And I think Japan for so many years, even that it's kind of similar to England, this tiny island was a war power. Remember, the only war that Russia lost was to Japan. <laughs> you know, or got you know that was, that, was, that, that, that they, they went head to head. You know, and like Japan did really well against Russia. You know, uh, so anyway, so they they for years they had seen themselves as as you know as the aggressor. You know, and of course they did a lot of evil things in China and that sort of stuff. And they had to, you know, now they're working it through. It's like, okay, we were the aggressor. We were the warlike. And now we can't defend ourselves. And now if Godzilla came after us, what would we do? And we would be ineffectual and our government wouldn't. So there's a lot of, I, I just feel like, the, I just feel like there is, a, there's a lot of, of Japan putting itself on the couch, going through these, these, you know, publicly dealing with it. And why not use Godzilla? Because it is, you know, it, to, to use a cliche, he's kind of the elephant in the room, you yeah, know, yeah. like and and you know and and he's the he's the kind of primal force that you know maybe even go as far as to say that he's Japan's id. Maybe I'm pushing it a little too far, but but to say that he's Japan's id, that he's the roiling unconscious from which you know they have to deal with modern life. And so I definitely I definitely feel like. They're working through a lot of their they're working through a lot of their cultural baggage through this uh, through this monster. And we actually have somebody in the chat who can confirm that Shin Godzilla did come after Fukushima and okay. was Thank you. apparently an intentional state, yeah. according to John Cairns, an intentional statement. So Charlie, I know you need to go in a few minutes. So if you want to say anything about where you're going to be, where we can find you later. Oh yeah, uh, I am reading. I am reading at three o'clock Eastern time in the uh, in the reading room. So please come by. I am going to be debuting brand new material from a as yet unfinished novel, Vamp City Two. Some of you who've read my work know Vamp City, and uh, so that's the that's gonna be a, a debut for me. So I want to thank you all very much because. Uh, this is this was one of my childhood obsessions, and uh, I rarely get a chance to talk Godzilla with anybody. So I'm sorry I have to leave, but thank you all. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to Liz. What's your thought on this? I I have similar thoughts about the shared psyche because if some like a creature like Godzilla is going to be like mascot, maybe isn't the technical term, but like if he's going to be the mascot of Japan, he has to represent different aspects of Japanese culture and feelings and the shifts over time and how he interacts with things. I think it's, there was a change definitely in the destructive nature, especially after Japanese became nuclear powered. You notice that when he destroys Tokyo, he never, or when he destroys cities in Japan, he never really takes down like a power plant or something because that would wipe out the whole island. Yeah. He does a different type of destruction that is almost creative in a sense, especially in the comics. It's destruction that leads to creation. So there's a rebirth after which is sort of like a hope you have after uh, 
terrible tragedies, the tsunamis for sure, also the nuclear incidents. And you see this in other places too, like Chernobyl. And I'm sorry that he had to leave, but also Louisiana after the hurricane, Katrina, you see like there's a rebirth, like an ecological rebirth after a terrible tragedy. And I think you see that at the end of Godzilla movies, there's like this feeling of hope and that's a shift. It's not like a feeling of terror and we learned our lessons. Like Godzilla and other monsters leave like a feeling of hope afterward that things can grow from here because the bad has been like scraped away. Okay. I interesting I to, yeah, I find it interesting to contrast the, you know, the bulk of the Godzilla movies, the Japanese movies where Godzilla is very much, um, like that mascot isn't the right word, avatar for, for Japan, mm. um, with attempts by Hollywood to rethink Godzilla and they, they don't get it. It's, it would be like Japan trying to do a Superman or Batman movie. It's like, it's too much entrenched in the culture. And so you have those awful recuts with, you know, with, with Raymond Burr stuck in as an American reporter, mm. you that, the horrible 90s thing where when when all the the Godzilla clones are running around Madison Square Garden and my reaction was oh look at the CGI you know it was just there was no connection there the more re even the more recent ones and I, I have had fun with the more recent Hollywood versions but just look at the most recent uh you know Godzilla versus Kong wow Godzilla needs a new agent that movie was so biased towards King Kong because King Kong, you know, maybe from Africa, but he's ours. And Godzilla is, for us, for Hollywood, the other. And there's a real contrast between our Godzilla films and their Godzilla films. I think the, the equivalent of the Japanese bad take would be the Jap Japanese Spider-Man, the Spider-Man emissary from hell, where they just don't get Spider-Man and he has like a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think uh, Godzilla often becomes a mascot or avatar as he's softened, uh, but Godzilla's power as, as a cultural figure usually comes from him existing as a different kind of other. He's not, he's the non-alien other. He's the, he is the known nature or malfeasance of nature uh, that can absolutely destroy, can be provoked, can be the result of people's hubris or people's ignorance uh, and will sometimes bail you out, especially if he's been softened, if he's if he's in a more commercial entertainment product, especially ones uh, directed towards children, but that he can just as easily come out of a conflict against another monster turning on humans again immediately. Like the end of Godzilla 2000, which was the great reintroduction of Godzilla, was uh, he's beaten the monster, the alien monster, he saved us, and now he's torching the city because during this movie, you all were jerks, and he didn't forget that. <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes he's an emotional avatar. Like the, the, I believe in America, it was called Godzilla 1985. Uh, in Japan, it was called The Return of Godzilla, where right. he is a walking metaphor for American-Russian relations. Uh, and at the same time as he's attacking Japan and feasting on nuclear reactors, uh, the Russians and the Americans are debating over who's going to nuke Japan to get rid of this thing before it comes and bothers us. And the, the entire movie is about how Japan has been trapped between superpowers and how does it negotiate when it has little agency. And that, that's, the way, that's the way that filmmakers have been leveraging Godzilla for a while. I think somebody mentioned in the chat that, it's more, that he's more like a protecting spirit. And I think that is a, a very Japanese take on that because that is something they have protecting spirits that are like their own entities that aren't necessarily avatars, but they are like forces of a spirit that are good or, you know, sometimes malicious. That's a really good take. Yeah. Or just playing on Karen, because sometimes Godzilla very much comes over as he's just trashing stuff because it's in his way. There's no malice to what Godzilla's doing. He just he's just big and clumsy and swings his tail and takes out a skyscraper. So I know Liz had a specific thing she wanted to discuss, which was Mothra and ecology. Yeah. So I'm going to let her do that. Yeah, I, I mean, Mothra is like the, she's one of the few kaiju that started out as good. Like even when she's in her first, I'm not going to talk about those, those unusual Heisei films, which are a, 
an experience. <laughs> but she's like, she's like the first female female kaiju, and also she represents like healing, and she is a protector. And then coming from a, t- a different perspective, like an American one from like an indigenous background, that she's protecting these people who have gone back to nature. It's a very interesting perspective, especially compared to Godzilla, like trashing this hyper, um, like quickly evolving Japan that is coming up to date with like the technical age. And Mothra is protecting her little infant island with its people who are just still somehow magically not being destroyed by radiation tests. (laughs) Um, She's an interesting character because she's like a mythical creature, but she's also one of the few that heals and she dies over and over again. There's no, you're never worried when Mothra dies. Like it's the cycle of death and rebirth, sort of like with nature, something terrible happens. And then some like, you know, grass grows up through the cracks of the concrete. And she's sort of that symbol in the the comics in particular, um, even in like the really brutal fighting comics, like uh, Rulers of the Earth, she's still sort of like this, benevolent spirit who's out trying to help people and in cataclysm when you've lost all faith in humanity because they have absolutely wrecked everything and they tried to like mind control the people using Ghidorah's skull like they tried to mind control kaiju and control them even then she's still very forgiving and trying to save like the other uh Viatine who's like the she was like a rose but she's not a rose in the comics she's like a weird snap trap plant creature um She's trying to bring back life on Earth because literally everything is dead. This is like post-apocalyptic Godzilla. So there's nothing to destroy because there's nothing. <laughs> um, and she's there bringing back, so she's literally protecting as like a pollinator, the one plant we have that is trying to bring the Earth back to life. I see in the comments, someone mentioned their wife's favorite monster is Mothra. Mothra is like the most popular monster with women. So mm. it's a slight stereotype that I love her, but as an eco-critical scholar, of course I do. Oh. Well, Liz, maybe you could put a link to where people can find potentially find Cataclysm in the chat. Oh. If, you can if you're in Baltimore it. City, we have it at the library. Um, it's available as a digital comic, so check with your local library for sure. I don't know. I don't think it's still in printing. I think they're working on a different okay. series now. Okay, I, I just figured. I just figured I'd ask us. You've brought it up several times now, and mm-hmm. there might be people who would like to read this. If you're if your library has Hoopla, which is the like the digital comic platform, it's definitely on there in the Godzilla collection. There's a massive Godzilla collection. Okay, awesome. Okay, so does anyone else have an opinion on Godzilla and ecology? I mean, I sort of jumped to an immediate thought that in, that might be a point where Godzilla is representing technology going too far out of control and Mothra is be like, hey, maybe we need to slow down and think about it and not cut that tree down Mm. what do the other two think on the ecological so i I think the oh sorry you go ahead all right so so i think i think shin godzilla has probably done the most interesting work with godzilla versus ecology because its ultimate standpoint is not this is a thing to get along with or this is a thing to beat it's this is a facet of the world and we need to adapt to it. How are, how are you gonna create technology that reduces harm knowing that this is just something we share the planet with? Uh, and it, it's interesting because that's a theme that has touched on in many Godzilla movies, although in, in a more superficial way where it's like, well, we'll give him his own island. I mean, what could he want more than just having his own island? Surely the, the living incarnation of earthquakes will just stay on that island. Like, no, uh, it, it could come here at any time. So what are we going to do about city building? What are we going to do about energy management? What are we going to do about disaster relief to minimize the harm? And that's, that is a, it is, it is at once an eternal message and it is one, it is simultaneously the kind of messaging with Kaiju, which are these larger than life creatures that are often stand-ins for natural disasters. That's imperative to think about in a world where we can reduce the harm of climate change, but we know at this point we are going to be encountering it. We are encountering it. Um, and that's something that's something kaiju fiction is particularly in a place to talk about. Um, similarly, uh, Godzilla adjacent uh, Gamera, our, our lovely big turtle that uh, shoots fire out of his butt to fly, um, was <laughs> rebooted in the 90s Heisei era. And the trilogy of Heisei Gamera films are all about uh, the increasing divorce between 
uh, this ecological spiritual figure and what does it cost us if we're further away from it and not in tune with the the ecology of the land. And um, when talking about all of this stuff, it is always worth remembering that Japan is in an earthquake zone mm -hmm. <clears throat> and has some of the world's best expertise in, they're really, really good at building big buildings in earthquake zones because, and people in California, were, they're going to, Cal is engineers are going to California to help California because they had to be, they have no choice. Yeah. You get, when you're in an earthquake zone, you get really good at building things to withstand earthquakes. Okay, I so John makes a, oh, sorry. Oh. I was gonna say John makes a good point about the climate change because Japan is one of the places that is high at risk for being, you know, disappearing into the ocean. Yeah. And they knew that in the nineties when some of these films were made, that's where they signed that climate, there was a climate accord in the nineties. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, this, this is, this is, Way, way beyond my pay scale. But it, it, it's inherent right at the beginning. I mean, why does Godzilla get released in the first film? It's, the, it, it's really, it's the law of unintended consequences. Mankind, oh, we can do, look at the powers we have. We can do whatever we want. Oh, we didn't know we were releasing Gohira out of the ocean. And I think that that's sort of like implied through, through all of these films that, you know, that uh, why is Godzilla doing these things? Well, who started it? And it's us. Yeah. Yeah. What, I just I just want to say, like, well, King, well, the most recent Kong versus Godzilla is a very goofy movie. Uh, they did restore one element of Godzilla I've always liked, which is he knows your your trifling. He he was over chilling out somewhere and he heard you. He knows you're building something down there. That's why he's here. He yeah. he Godzilla gets cranky when he knows you're you're hubrising. Okay, so. We have a we question have, in the Q&A, I don't know if that's... We have a question in the Q&A, and uh, by the way, I believe now is a good time to welcome any more questions people might have. Please put them in the Q&A, because I may not see them if they're in the chat. And let's start with Cass is asking, what's the best role you think human characters can play in a Godzilla story? Well, in a movie, a very quiet one, because some of that's <laughs> dialogue. <laughs> um, of course, this is a cheating question for me because humans are intrinsically tied to Mothra. So like not humans or humankind. Sometimes they're human sized, sometimes they're tiny. But there's a she has a connection to humanity, and so does Batra, sort of like her, I won't say nemesis, but like sort of the anti-hero equivalent. Uh, Batra is like the eco-fascist response to Mothra. So like that same thing, like they're connected to humans in an intrinsic way, either to wipe them out because they don't want them there or uh, or to interact with them. Like we, like uh, Mothra, her twins talking for them. Uh, but you know, if they're not, oh gosh, especially the newest movie, some of that dialogue, I was just like, please stop, please. You could just be a little, well, let's go back to the monsters yeah. or in a more serious way, maybe have the humans take their roles a little more seriously and not try to, you know, destroy the earth with a giant mecha creature, try yeah. to control everything, go too far. Uh, I, it, I think it really depends on the story that the Godzilla movie is telling. We live in this wonderful era where there's more than 20 of these and they do, these movies do very different things. Um, I'm extremely fond. I think Liz, you brought up Biolanti, um, yeah. who I, who I love, who is, part bro's DNA, part Godzilla DNA, part your dead daughter's DNA, which yeah. is a wonderful origin story for anything. I wish I had that kind of DNA. Uh, and uh, that, that movie opens up the idea that there are, there are psychics who are being trained to try to just nudge Godzilla's consciousness. And like, what if you didn't? Like, I know you're in kind of a hangry mood. What if you ate a Snickers and didn't eat Tokyo today? Um, and similarly try to understand motives or push and, and having some interface. Uh, I, and if you're gonna go into like the Gonzo uh, sci-fi route of Godzilla, I think having, having humans that get the characters to some degree helps greatly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a nice thing about Kong versus Godzilla again. I loved Kong's little buddy who signs with him. Um, I think that is a way better take on the uh, mute native, like which is usually, a really problematic trope. Here it's just, oh, she's deaf, she signs. 
Like that is way better. And of course, a, of course, a primate can sign. Uh, we, we know other primates have signed. So why shouldn't a super primate? Um, exactly. And then the, the complete flip side is if, if it is about, if your story is about divorce between the kaiju and the humans, the, if there's supposed to be a massive schism between them, I think I am a huge sucker for the humans who are trying to do some kind of tracking or disaster relief or aid on the scale that they have capacity for. Again, that's why Shin, Shin Godzilla is so successful. It turns out that the majority of Godzilla, that actually there's no Godzilla film where Godzilla's on screen for 25% of the time. He's always been on screen for less because it's really expensive and also he doesn't talk. It's very hard. It's been very hard for filmmakers to make stories entirely about him. So what are you gonna do with your human characters? Well, in Godzilla 2000, you have uh, the first ever Godzilla weather prediction unit who's just going out there trying to come up with how do we warn people like how do we track this thing how do we predict it or in Shin Godzilla I'm sorry that was Godzilla 2000 in Shin Godzilla it's try it, it is the infrastructure of politics trying to get the people who are capable into roles so that they can help evacuate mm -hmm. and I think those those help us tell the human toll of, of kaiju stories, or and especially kaiju stories as metaphor for real suffering. So those are the those are my favorite uses of humans in those sorts. Uh, of stories. Well, my my favorite human, and again, I'm coming as the film critic, is Taka I'm gonna let me get this right. Takashi Shimura, who is in the very first Godzilla film. He's the older scientist, and why why does he stand out to me? Because he was a major Japanese actor. If you've ever seen Rashomon or the Seven Samurai, he's in it. And he's also in the original Godzilla. So it wasn't all just a bunch of, you know, unknowns or, you know, people who were, you know, their specialty was kaiju movies. Here was, you know, one of the top actors in Japan appearing in the first, uh, you know, Godzilla, Gohira film. So that's, he's always been special to me. Okay. Okay. So our next question is from Carol. What is the best creature Godzilla fought? I love Mechagodzilla. Um, <laughs> it predates Terminator by 10 years, even though it's a doppelganger whose flesh gets blown off to reveal there's a robot underneath, which is so weird to think that Terminator ripped off Godzilla, uh, which didn't necessarily happen, but I will say it did. Um, I, I think the, the doppelganger made out of technology either by us or by aliens is really fascinating and it introduces some of the most fun camp elements um, in the, I think it's the, the Millennium series. Uh, we built Mechagodzilla on a dead Godzilla's bones and now it's haunted by a Godzilla ghost. And that's just so ridiculous that how can you not love it? Uh, and then of course I'm a sucker for, for King Ghidorah because you know, what's better than one dragon head? Three dragon heads. I uh, also love Mechagodzilla, but I'm not going to say that because you already said it. <laughs> That's, it's so good, though. It's like one of the few things like in the history of like Mecha, especially in Japan, that's always the one that gets left out. They're like, well, it's not quite like everything else. And I'm like, it's Godzilla. Like, come on. <laughs> um, always gets left out. Uh, and yeah, of course, Kikidora is really great, especially my favorite thing is like Mothra literally pushing him over because he doesn't have arms and he can't push her away. That's like my favorite scene. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say, oh, I can't say that it is Mechagodzilla. Oh, yeah, you, can, you can say it's Mechagodzilla. It's, it's so good, it's so good. I mean, it's terrible in such a good way. And I really like- thought, oh, sorry. It's well thought out. It's well thought out to have like this weird robot creature and the haunting aspect. Like, I think they kept part of that weird bloodthirstiness even in the new movie where it's like, there's something not quite right about it. Oh, so good, so good. Uh, and I'm not gonna say Mothra because I don't feel like she's like a villain that he fights. I feel like they're like friends or colleagues, work acquaintances. <laughs> We are at five minute warning and I would like to get to John's question. So Dan, if you could answer this one real quick. Real quick, I would say, uh, Ghidra, King Ghidorah, you know, you, usually you chop off the head of a monster, you kill it, not, not in this case. And the last question we have is from John Purcell. And I don't know whether any of you can answer this, but let's give it a try. Just for the heck of it, has anybody ever tallied up 
how many times Tokyo has been destroyed by Godzilla and other kaiju? No, I have Can we count that high? Yeah. A lot. A lot. But uh, the funny thing is that like Godzilla only attacks Tokyo like four or five times. He goes because the th like the classic Godzilla theme is actually titled Godzilla Comes Ashore in Osaka. Uh, you know, he he's on a he's on at least a nationwide tour. Uh, <laughs> but he's but he did his best work. He did his best work in Tokyo. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I think like I was thinking about it, like when you watch it, I'm like, it's not all Tokyo. There's other stuff, but it's a lot. Yeah. And there are some even in the comics, there are times when he comes back for like a return trip, you know, encore. <laughs> yeah, I think my, my favorite Godzilla world tour is in Godzilla Final Wars, where he throws another kaiju into the Sydney Opera House. He's like, that's how we know he's in Australia. He destroyed the Sydney Opera House. Well, of course he did. I mean, yeah. what else would you destroy that would tell the audience immediately you're in Australia without you having to do anything else? Yeah. Dan? Yeah. Do you say this figure's only four or five times? I, 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 no, I, no, I have no idea how many, how many yeah, times. I, I like, I, I like the, the the Japanese tour concept too. Yeah, <laughs> it's a concert shirt I would wear. Yeah, there's music too. <laughs> <laughs> Might type the lyrics in the side. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, we in the the sort of image of Godzilla is always him destroying Tokyo, but he does destroy quite a few other things too. Yeah. I, I enjoyed in uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters where he attacks Boston and deliberately wrecks the green monster. <laughs> uh, so that's a particularly wonderful dad joke hidden in plain sight. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so I mean for, the, for those of us in Boston, it was so obviously not in Boston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, because he could get good. anywhere in traffic. <laughs> Okay, so we just got our two minute warning. So this is a chance for final words and anything you got want to plug, mention, other panels you're on or whatever. Let's start with John. Uh, all right, so I have one more panel left at Balticon. Uh, in half an hour, I will be on uh, stepping outside of your genre comfort zone. Um, and besides being a kaiju nut, I uh, grew up with a literary tradition uh, education and had to do a crash course later in life on science fiction. That's when I fell in love with it. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, I have a bunch of short stories out uh, that came out recently. Um, uh, none of them are about kaiju. Tell you what, if you the closest thing to a kaiju, uh, for lack of a bed, I think is my pinned tweet on my Twitter. It's at Wiswell. Uh, if you want... A uh, story about an evil sofa. I'll yield the floor to my friends. Okay, Daniel? Okay, very quickly. I, uh, uh, you can find my reviews of classic science fiction films in Space and Time magazine. Um, I also am the author of Jar Jar Binks Must Die, a collection of essays on science fiction movies, which was a uh, Hugo finalist, which is another way of saying I lost. And, the, and I also write humorous science fiction, of which my latest is Father of the Bride of Frankenstein. Yes. Okay, then. Oh, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> but you have to. You <laughs> have to. But you get to go that. I'm uh, Liz Bosarge. I'm on Twitter at Liz A. Bosarge. I'm a librarian in Baltimore, so if you live in the city, come visit me. Uh, and we're starting Summer Challenge on Tuesday because Monday is a holiday and we will have a science fiction box for all of our fans here. So you come in, you get a box with a free science fiction book and some other stuff I'm not allowed to tell you about because it's a surprise. Awesome. Oh, cool. Also, I review for School Library Journal if you want to read about science fiction books for teenagers or science books for teenagers. So. Awesome. And I'm, I'm Jennifer Covey. I'm a writer of science fiction and fantasy. And at 7 p.m. tonight, I will be on a panel where instead of talking about the evolution of Godzilla, we're going to talk about the evolution of first contact, which I'm really looking forward to. So hopefully I will see some of you at that one. And this was our somewhat serious panel about Godzilla. And thank you to my panelists. Thank you very much to the audience. And I think this is us out of time. And thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out. That was a delight. Yeah.
that yeah. that went really well, I think. Yeah. They, it's a great topic. I mean, I was hoping to learn something and I did because, you know, I'm very kaiju. I'm more a B-movie fan than a kaiju fan. Mm. We should do an anthology of climate fiction with kaijus in it. If you uh, if you're yes. for something to really torture yourself with, I highly recommend those three Mothra films by Heisei. <laughs> <laughs> they were rough. That was really bad. The, the, I, will the, the, al- I will always take recommendations for, for movies that are bad my, my husband specifically will always take recommendations for movies that are so bad they are funny. Oh, well, that mm. one's it. They turn them off into a fish creature. Yep. That's the worst part. That's the worst. And she's like well known for being like the, the, like the lady kaiju. And they're like, what if we made her a boy and a fish? <laughs> yeah. so I'm weird. curious, the, the, comic, the comics you mentioned, are they manga or are they uh, American? Oh, no. Um, there are some manga, but I think those are mostly out of print. Uh, but the the one they're Western comics, and some of them are fairly new. I would say they came around like that '90s boom, and they're still publishing them. So Cataclysm is relatively new. I think it came out in the 2014, something like that. Was that from IDW? I think so. I think they currently own the property, intellectual property, to do the comics, and they're still putting out comics. They have single issues you can get. Uh, the ones I was talking about were collected, and you can finish. You can read the whole Cataclysm now. It's out. Mm. Awesome. And uh, Oblivion. So, and don't yeah, read Wars of the Earth. Cataclysm is about to throw us out of the room. So. Yeah, I, so oh, right. I, I am so going to have to uh, close this room so we can set up for the next one, but I do encourage you. You still have some people listening, so I do encourage you to go over to the uh, Discord server if you're on that, Pride of Baltimore 2, um, and uh, continue the discussion there. Thanks so much. It was a wonderful panel. Awesome. Have a lovely day, everyone.